Tom Sokolovsky, el director del Museo Warhol, eh, dueño de todas las piezas que se están exhibiendo en la exposición y quienes han sido nuestros colaboradores y a quienes les debemos un enorme agradecimiento por este proyecto, por hacerlo posible en Colombia. Eh, tengo a mi izquierda a Philip Larratt Smith, el curador de esta exposición, eh, una exposición que no es solamente eh, una muestra de la obra de Warhol, sino que plantea eh, una visión crítica, una visión eh, interpretativa de la obra de Warhol, en la que ustedes encontrarán que además del de, de artista de, que utiliza los medios masivos, es un artista que tiene posiciones críticas y el mismo Philip eh, presenta una posición muy interesante eh, para aquellos que, que son conocedores de Warhol y para aquellos también que no son conocedores de Warhol. Esta es una exposición que se hizo posible gracias al apoyo de instituciones como la Fundación Alzate Avendaño, de los medios como la W y Semana y gracias también al apoyo de Coca-Cola y gracias al apoyo de muchísima gente eh, con la cual estamos eh, muy agradecidos. Los dejo entonces eh, con Philip y Tom que van a tener una conversación al final tendremos algún espacio para preguntas y muchas gracias por venir. Hello. I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about the title for the show. Uh, Mr. America obviously refers to the bodybuilding competition that used to take place. I don't know if it still takes place on the west coast of the United States. And it deals with the idea of self-transformation of the 98-pound weakling who takes a six-week course of weightlifting and becomes a hero, becomes a, becomes a kind of myth or an idealized image of himself. And this is an important, uh, I think this is a good figure to introduce Andy Warhol because Warhol himself um, lived a life of many self-transformations. He really lived the American idea of reinventing yourself. He tweaked his image constantly. And... I think, that, uh, I think that for Warhol, the, um, the American dream was something that was very real. It wasn't, it wasn't completely illusory. It was something that he, in his life, through hard work and artistic success, was able to achieve. And at the same time, the title is supposed to be a bit of a provocation because, of course, um, I'm aware of the fact that uh, you know, Warhol himself has a quote in which he says, I know that it makes people upset in Latin America when we say America because they say that America refers to the entire continent, but... For us, it really refers to us. Everyone knows it refers to us, and we have the right to do whatever we want. And so that's how it's going to be. And so the idea is that you know, it's not simply an exploration of Warhol's work, but also of his relationship to American culture, American ideology, and specifically the intersections between political and popular culture in his work. So let me pass you over to you, Tom, yep. and see if maybe you can build on that. Well, building on, well, thank you, and thank you for having us here in Bogota, and I hope you'll enjoy the show for the run of the summer. I think Philip chose a very interesting topic for this exhibition, because so very often one sees Andy Warhol's work as very, very light, attractive, something that is happy to look at. Um, for people my age who were around in the 60s, uh, it could be seen as what might be called retro, But for many people, I think Warhol's work represents a time, not just Andy Warhol and not just visual arts, but a time, particularly in the early part of his professional career in the 1960s, during that pop period, when everything, politics, music, dance, sexuality, everything was very open. Um, everything was being changed at the time. The Beatles were there, and that was a very different kind of music from anything that had come before, and it became international in a certain sense. Women now could have short hair, and men could have long hair, and although that may seem superficial to many of you who are young here in the audience, at the time, people thought it was awful, and anyone who had long hair was, a lesbi uh, was, was gay, and anyone who had short hair was a lesbian. And we all know that's not true, obviously. Um, But then we had the killing of our President Kennedy in the last months of 1963, and it became a change. For Andy Warhol, I think it was the moment when this dream of what America could be, and really what the world could be, but what America could be for a working class kid. I think something that most people don't know because they think of Andy Warhol knowing movie stars and sports stars and uh, pornographers and uh, pornographic actors and actresses and being in the limelight was that he grew up in absolute poverty. 
when he was born in 1928 in a city like Pittsburgh, which was very much stratified in a caste system. And he was at the very lowest part of uh, that caste system. And I think part of what you need to understand, and I think Philip Shaw does this very well, is to know that Warhol, even from the last years of his life, was always an outsider. Always someone looking in from the outside, saying, oh, isn't that interesting? I didn't know what it was like to be a princess. Oh, I didn't know what it was like to be a, uh, a rich person living on Park Avenue in New York or on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. But underneath it all, it was a working class kid. I will tell you one anecdote, which is probably very problematic, but when Warhol's diaries, which he kept diligently from the early 70s, were published posthumously, a lot of interesting private commentary came out. And in one instance, he was talking about uh, Studio 54 and talking about his friend Bianca Jagger, who really he had made a star and he had created Studio 54 as the most exciting um, nightclub in the world. And he said, Bianca Jagger is just so fabulous and all of her friends, like the fashion designer Halston, are fabulous and she knows movie stars and rich people and just to be next to her is wonderful. But then he would say, oh, but didn't they have soap in Nicaragua? She smells, she has body odor. So that notion of, on the one level, taking that vulgar English term, star fucker, and I hope that doesn't offend anyone, of wanting, but then saying, as, a, as an everyday person, I don't want to sit next to someone who smells. So it was always that notion of looking at these people, but keeping them at a distance. And the last thing I'll say, just to, come, uh, to follow up uh, Philip's comments, was that one of the things we've, we've now learned some 22 years after Warhol's death, was that everything in his work, how he viewed himself, how he viewed America, how he viewed these famous people, was very much a construction. Because unlike almost all the people he, he photographed, who at one point, like Marilyn Monroe, was the greatest star in the world, and then died from drug abuse, or others, Warhol always kept everyone at a distance, observing, commenting, and he then died, and we only now are beginning to understand what he really thought inside. And then the last thing I'll say on this is that many people don't know that his name as he was born was Warhol A with an A at the end. And when he came to New York that was changed and there are very, various reasons why that happened and he said that was a good thing. Because then he had a name like Smith, like Mr. Mr. Philip Larkin, Laird Smith has and you could walk down the streets and people wouldn't say, are you Spanish? Are you Polish? Are you German? Are you Italian? No, I'm just American. I'm just Mr. America. I think that's one of the things about America that really appealed to Andy Warhol, that the, this notion that you can come to America and shed your previous identity and simply by dint of being an American citizen and accepting the melting pot, you get to have all the privileges and perks that come with being an American citizen. You get to participate in this great consumer culture. You can drink the same Coca-Cola that the bum on the street drinks but that the president drinks and you can't get a better Coca-Cola no matter how rich you are. I think, you know, to some extent these remarks that Warhol would make, like, oh, in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes, uh, were intended as, uh, as a provocation. Warhol was very sophisticated at manipulating his audience. But underlying it, I think that Warhol also thought that there was something really great about, you know, the egalitarian potential of something like McDonald's. He, he would think McDonald's is great. You go everywhere and it's exactly the same. And isn't it great to have something like that that you can, you can rely on? I think Tom touches on an important point when he says that Warhol's early life in, as someone who rose from poverty is really, really crucial because it liberated him from a lot of what I would describe as bourgeois prejudices regarding the making